You're listening to the Confessions of a Hashtag Beauty Boss podcast. I'm your host, Angela Sanchez, beauty business mentor and founder of Beauty Business Co. I want you to believe that you can achieve anything if you set your mind to it. I'll be interviewing leading beauty industry professionals and discovering exactly what drove them to becoming the hashtag beauty boss they are today. Are you ready to be inspired? You're listening to episode 68 of the Confessions of a Hashtag Beauty Boss podcast with today's guest, Karen Geisler. Karen is a clinical educator and founder of KG Beauty Modality Training. Winner of the 2023 ABIA Soul Operator of the Year. And after 30 years of industry experience, she is on a mission to give back to our industry, helping you build and grow your business. I recently met Karen at the Regional Beauty Long Lunch on the Sunshine Coast, which Karen has organized for our industry to connect, collaborate, and bring education and inclusivity to our regional industry professionals. The next Regional Beauty Long Lunch is on the 12th of November in Bundaberg, so come along for a guaranteed fun day out. This episode is brought to you by our 50 Instagram Stories for Beauty Bosses free guide. It can be a struggle to come up with what to do or say each day for your stories, but it is a known fact that there is more sales converted by stories for beauty business owners because conversions and conversations start in the DMs. And this speed tracks your followers' decision-making process. So download our free 50 Instagram Stories for Beauty Bosses ebook today at dbb.beautybusinessco.com slash free stories. Let's get into this week's episode. Karen, welcome to my virtual beauty lounge. It is absolutely fabulous to have you on the show today. How are you? I'm fantastic, Angela, and thank you for having me. I'm so looking forward to our little chat today. I know. I recently met you in person at the Sunshine Coast Long Lunch that you have facilitated for our industry, which is just so incredible to like collectively bring our industry together specifically in regional parts of Australia so far, because I know, FYI, you might be going international soon. (laughs) And, like, I just think how incredible because there are so many regional beauty business owners a part of our community that just always seem to come up with the obstacles of not receiving the same support as what a city salon could. So by putting something like this on, I feel like you're just creating that inclusivity for our industry, which is just amazing. And I can't wait to hear your story because I know that that's probably stemmed from what you've experienced through your journey, a part of the industry. So I would love, though, to start our interview with what your definition of a hashtag beauty boss is. Look, my definition of a beauty boss is determination, sheer grit, persistence and passion. Well said. Straight to the point. I've been around probably a little bit longer than you have and I just, I wanted to take the the BS out of the industry because I've seen it for three decades and I just want to take it back to being real, raw and um, authentic. Absolutely. And, you know, I feel like there is a lot of pivoting in our industry and community and connection as being a big part of that, which I feel like for what you are doing now, after three decades of being in the industry, it's just so fabulous to see that you're now becoming a leader and sharing your knowledge in ways that has not been really accessible for such a long period of time and then bringing community together. So where did it all begin for you, though? So three decades. I know. I'm showing my vintage now, aren't I? Well, Um, you look fabulous. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Look, I started in the industry when I was 14 and nine months. So my first trade is hairdressing, and I was working in a salon on a Saturday morning, and then I got offered an apprenticeship when I was 14 and nine months. You can't start an apprenticeship until you're 15. So I did three months probation and then I started my hairdressing apprenticeship 
And then I worked in a salon. I'm originally from Sydney, so I worked in a salon at Ramsgate. And then halfway through my third year, my beautiful dad, who's passed away, said to me, kiddo, I can see your passion. I can see your dream. There's a clinic for sale. Would you like to buy it? He said, I'll loan you the money, but you have to pay me back. He said, but there's one condition, you have to do a small business management course before I hand it over to you. And and I was so caught up in the excitement, I really didn't realise the enormity of what my father was offering me. That was when interest rates were 17.5%. So we bought the, um, the salon and yeah, didn't I get knocked off my pedestal real quickly. I was so caught up in the excitement that here I was at 17 with my first business and doing the books. Back then, there was no point of sale system, paper ledgers. So, yeah, that's when my journey started. And then I finished that at 19, my apprenticeship. And then I went back and did beauty therapy three nights a week while still running the hairdressing side of it at About Face Academy in Five Dock under Shirley Strickland and had that clinic. And then I bought another clinic at Sylvania. And I had that clinic with five staff for probably about six and a half, seven years. And then I moved to Queensland. Didn't know anyone, packed up and I'd actually got divorced and my dad passed away that year. And I packed up and moved to Queensland and started all over again. Had a clinic at Harvey Bay for five years. And then I met my wonderful husband now, Brad. And moved up to Childers, well, actually Apple Tree Creek. It's 10 k's out of Childers in Queensland, between Harvey Bay and Bundaberg. And I'm on 13 acres here and I purposely built a clinic on the property. And here I've been ever since. I love, love, love that. And I love the fact that you have created a business around the life that you wanted to design. I'm very much a big believer in that, like lifestyle first and obviously with a huge life change that was going, we have like so much that we can relate to each other about Karen. Like it's really important to really probably put a big switch in place for you to create and invite new abundance into your life. And so tell me about like the building the business from home, from scratch, from not knowing anyone in your community to then having, you know, built the business to what it is today because it's been extremely successful. We do have a big home-based beauty salon community, a part of Beauty Business Co. I also owned my own home-based beauty studio for eight years. And, you know, there's this stigma around the professionalism of what's created when you have a home-based business. And I like to call a bit of bullshit on that because, There are so many women out there who are, say, starting their lives again from scratch and they have this incredible knowledge and industry experience that they can build and create family life around. It doesn't always have to be like you had done originally and clearly skyrocketed forward with the big team and all of that, but it doesn't always have that definition of success for everybody. So I'd love to hear from you on that scale of things and how you navigated that starting from scratch. I was looking to get out of Sydney because when dad passed away, it was kind of like, there's too many memories here. I know that sounds like I'm running away, but everywhere I turned, I could just, it was dad. So we were really, really close. So I had to make a decision and I was sick of working 70, 80 hours a week. And I just kind of, I needed to slow down. I'd lost about 35 kilos and the doctor kind of said to me, two more kilos and you're in hospital. So I had to pull the brakes on something. I did look at a property at Coffs Harbour and I missed out on auction there. And then the house at Harvey Bay came up. So I drove up from Sydney to Harvey Bay, looked at it on the Monday, bought it on the Thursday and drove back to Sydney and packed up. I didn't know anybody. I'd never been past Noosa. So I had no idea. My girlfriends were saying to me, Harvey Bay, that's where all retirees go. And I just went, oh, well, I said, it's pretty. I like it. So I bought a house on two and a half acres. And if anyone knows me, I'm a city girl. I love my Westfield shopping centres. So for me to go rural, if you had said to me 20 years ago, would I be doing this? I would have laughed. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so- there's still no Westfields, actually, three decades later. And they've got the stock 
Uplands, which is amazing. <laughs> My parents have retired to Harvey Bay, so I know the town well, and it's bloody beautiful. It's a really, really lovely town to go to. It is lovely, and when I moved there, we had two sets of traffic lights and roundabouts. That was it. And Saturday trading closed at 12 o'clock. So I moved there in 2003, and boy, has it changed now. It's just leaps and bounds, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful part of the world, and more people need to explore it. So when I moved up, I went to council to find out what the rules and regulations were to set up the business. So I had a three-car garage. So I set the third garage up as the clinic. And there was a little bit of rigmarole there. We had to put fire retardant in the roof because the boundaries were too close to the fence. We had to put flooring that was curved up the walls because that was health regulation requirements. You can only operate certain hours because it's a home-based business. But we put all of that into place. The basins went in, the treatment rooms went in. And I ran that for probably five and a half years in that space. And I basically did letterbox drops and I actually went down to the local cinemas and signed up to do a marketing program with them. So we did a photo shoot and my ads came up before the movie started to let people know that the clinic was in Dundaran. And yeah, it just went from leaps and bounds from there. Amazing. Yeah. So like, did you find that those marketing techniques back then they were quite powerful that was the way in how you would really go and get your foot traffic because you were not receiving that from any shopping centers anyway but you really did have to go out and make it your own and probably having your like all of your true local and yellow pages and things like that back then yeah so that's what I did and look if anybody knows me everyone knows I love to have a chat so that wasn't hard just introducing myself to people and and I found that look I'll always be New South Wales through and through but I just found the culture of Queensland is when I first moved in I used to go and get the bins of an afternoon and all these people would drive past and wave and I used to think I don't know who you are why are you waving at me and it it really shocked me and I kind of realized living in a big city how disconnected you get from that kind of friendliness because everybody's so busy and we don't stop and acknowledge people are around us. So, yeah, that was a really good learning curve for me. And now I go back to Sydney and I say hello to everyone and they look at me weird now. Yes, it is a bit different. I Going to Harvey Bay is one thing, but like being on the Sunshine Coast now for the last three years, when I do go back into Brisbane, with my son as well, he's like, oh, mum, get me back to the trees and like where the people are like nice. And in Brisbane, I think we're still a little bit more friendlier than the Sydney and the Victorians. I don't know why. I don't know why there's a divide. It doesn't really matter. It's like who you are as a human being, but there is. And yeah, there's a huge, big, like laid back culture here. And I love it. I'm here for it. Oh, it is. I can remember when I first moved to Harvey Bay, it was, I don't know, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I would have still been in the clinic in Sydney. And then I would have had to do the peak hour traffic because I lived about 45 minutes away from where the salon was in Sylvania. And 4.30, I'm walking on Dundaran Beach. I went, this is is what it's meant to be. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to tap into there is like the definition of success for others is not always, you know, having three different franchise businesses and a team of eight in each store, you know. And that for you in that time of your life would have been just perfection it was and a, still is. <laughs> yeah, oh, look, it still is. And then I met my husband now, Brad, and we I moved the clinic up to Apple Tree Creek and then we built a purpose-built building down the front of the 12 acres that we're on and I love it. I work my own hours when I want to work, how I want to work. Yeah, it's great. It's just something that I'm so grateful for. All the kids have left home now, so we're empty nesters. So that's another chapter that I did have heaps of time on my hands once all the kids left, but I seem to have filled that because that's when I decided four years ago I was doing contract training for a lot of other companies and a colleague in the industry said to me, why are you doing it for everybody else? Do it for yourself. And that's always a daunting task of, oh, my goodness, going out and doing something else 
that fear factor sets in, that imposter thing sits in. And then I kind of went, okay, let's do it. So yeah, I started KG Beauty and Modality Training. And that was right in the middle of COVID. I couldn't go anywhere. But I started putting all of those things into place to launch it. And when we did have the COVID shut down, I was really torn because I had both beauty therapy and hairdressing. So beauty therapy was closed down in the March. I think it was the 26th of March we actually had to close. But I could still do hairdressing. And it didn't sit right with me. I wasn't good with it. I was still, I can't understand why they separated both those industries and hairdressing could still carry on. I had girlfriends that had clinics in Brisbane and they were going to lose their houses. And it really cut me. And I spoke to Brad about it. So I made a conscious decision probably four days after all beauty clinics got shut down that I actually shut down as well. And I shut down for eight weeks out of respect to my colleague because it didn't sit right with me that I was still earning an income, but we're still in the same close area than, than when we're doing facials. So a lot of my colleagues thought I was an absolute nut job. Like, why would you not want to have an income? And I just went, look, it, we're begging to be closed down because we're still at risk as much as what the beauty industry was. So, yeah, for eight weeks, I shut the clinic down and it was kind of sour grapes in one respect because Brad and I did a few things together. We went fishing, we spent time together, but we went down for a picnic at um, Walker's Point, which is near Woodgate, and we both got bitten by mozzies and we both ended up with Ross River. So, yeah, that kind of floored me for probably about six months. I still have ups and downs with it. But yeah, there was good, bad, and the decision I made, I don't regret it. My conscience felt so much better in actually stopping work for those eight weeks that we were shut down. And it let me reset as well. Yeah, amongst all of what was going on chaotically in the world, going to work, all the conversations were going to probably be around it anyway. The mindset of, you know, people having to run their businesses when it was all happening, like the fear of people having the disease coming into clinics. It was all a huge mess. So I can totally understand why you did what you did. And you know what? Intuitively, you thought that was right for you and good on you for setting a boundary there. So when you launched the modality side of it, I would love to hear how, you know, we've got a lot of aspiring beauty business owners that are stepping into the educational space as well. And to, yeah, share a little bit of knowledge around how that all became for you. Obviously, you were being seeked out by other training um, organizations. So you already had a step in the door there, which is amazing. Um, But how did you step over fear and imposter syndrome? I basically just sat down and I spoke to a few mentors. I had a wonderful mentor and, and she said, right, let's get this sorted. Let's start a plan. So I had trading manuals that I wrote a few years ago and stuff that I'd done in the industry that I'd kept notes on. So I started putting all of that together and figuring out how I wanted to structure it. And I wanted to structure it that it was bespoke in clinic training. So I actually physically go into the clinic and do the training. I was actually doing both the theory and the practical in clinic, but I'm starting to move away from the theory in clinic and doing that as self-paced courses. I find that us as therapists, the more hands-on we can be with a treatment, the better the outcome of the learning expectations are. So I started doing that and basically got the website built and it just went from there. I had some people that would recommend me and I was ringing clinics and letting them know what I was offering. I did the APAN conference so that kind of got me out there a little bit. I joined ABIC as an education supply member. So little things like that kind of opened it up and then I just had clinics that I knew in the industry and I was I was friends with through going to different functions and they said, oh, Karen, can you come in and teach this or can you do that or can we do this? And I customise it to each clinic. Take out what you don't need that you've already got 
and really focus on what you want to obtain as in a new skill set. Amazing. So good and so necessary as well. Again, like knowing that you can reach a whole heap of regional clinics as well now that you're going to be digitalizing the theory side of it. I can't wait to see what that evolves into because I know that that's going to be expansion for yourself, which I'm so excited for you for. But then, yeah, more impact for our industry and that's the end game at the end of the day. So there's a third pillar. (laughs) let's talk about the long lunch and where that stemmed from I'd love to just hear that story and how you're supporting and like what the goals are for that so when I moved up to Queensland I was really shocked at the lack of support and basically postgraduate classes or like little classes or trainings that girls could have access to they had to pack up and go to Sydney Brisbane or Melbourne And being a Sydney girl, it it never impacted me down there because everything was so close. And I just went, wow, there's nothing up here. Like, this is ridiculous. And then I started getting inquiries from clinics in regional areas. And I kept having the same conversation over and over again with all these regional clinics. This is fantastic. We can't believe that you're coming to Inverell or Armadale or Musselbrook or Atherton Tablelands or Hobart or Launceston, they were really shocked. And they said, we can't close our clinics and go to conferences in Sydney, Brisbane or Melbourne. It's a struggle for us and it's a 12-month plan for us to be able to take the whole team to Expo because yep. we've closed the clinic for four days and we've got no income coming in. And I thought about it and I came home and I went, wow, I'm not an event planner, but we need to get something to these regional clinics. So that's when I rang my wonderful, beautiful colleague, friend, Tamara Reed, and I said to Tamara, this is what I want to do. I want to do four of these a year. And she's like, oh, my goodness. She said, you're mad. And she was wonderful. She helped me a lot with stuff that she'd done with Butte Industry along the way. So she helped me and Then I started ringing some colleagues and just went, okay, this is the plan. This is what I want to do. Are you in? So for the first round, we had Gay Wardle. We had Vanessa McDonald. We had Rebecca Miller. We had Tara Shaw. And we had myself. And we did the first one in Tamworth. And we had 48 clinics there. And we had clinics that traveled three hours to come to this. and. The reason why I had it in Tamworth, that was where my dad was born and I'd always gone there as a kid. So I thought, okay, let's do the first one in Tamworth. Probably in hindsight, I probably should have done the first one in my own backyard. But anyway, it was brilliant. We had an absolute ball. And I can remember one of the attendees that came from Grafton. So she traveled from Grafton to Tamworth. And Sharon had been in the industry longer than me. And she stood up at that long lunch and she was like a little kid in a candy store. She'd follow Gay Wardle for years and she said, I'm so excited I actually get down and to have morning tea with Gay and talk to her about everything in the industry. So that really warmed my heart that I'd given these girls something to inspire them And the conversation she had with Gay at morning tea, she could take that back and implement it into her clinic. Yeah, so special. The legends of the industry, they really are like so looked up to by so many, whether they're city or regional, to actually be in a room with them is very, very special. Like you creating that opportunity for even just a quick hello, it's like, I mean, don't worry about Madonna or Beyonce, like Gay Wardle's in the room. <laughs> I know, I know. And it was just, I sat there and look, there was a few moments I had tears in my eyes because I could just see how engaged the clinic owners were. We had some special moments where girls got up and spoke in front of a room for the very first time. And that's what it's about. It's empowering therapists to realise hey, we can all collaborate and work together. I really want to get rid of this perception that we're all out to 
steal ideas off each other or take clients. That needs to go. It's a culture that was bred there for a while in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I really don't like it. And that's what I'm trying to stamp out is Mm. for clinics to work together. Yeah. Like if I'm booked out, I've got four clinics that are 50 k's away from me, and if I'm booked out, I refer them to those clinics. Amazing. And it's so important. Like I feel that has slowly but surely started to exit the building when it comes to that, but it is now really getting beauty business owners to realise the power of collaboration and partnership and how they can be really working together and whether they've niched into a skin-specific clinic when they used to be doing like all services, but now it's like, oh, well, how can I collaborate with the lash artist down the road to really work together? Yes. So, so amazing that you do that, but we need to see more of it as well. And yeah, I think that's why we align so well is that it's always empowering our industry to like, well, I truly believe that if you set your mind to anything, you can achieve it. And then we can do really so much more when we bind together in a community. It's it's truly powerful. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. So I think we should like share when your next regional long lunches now so that those listening can hear and we can also shout out and those of our industry can share about that as well even if you're not going or close by to it but the more that we can share about the regional long lunches um, the more impact we can make in our industry so do you want to take away where our next one is Okay, so our next one is on the 12th of November and that's at Rowers on the River in Bundaberg. So we've got six industry speakers. I'm so excited for this one. It's actually basically in my hometown now. So yeah, we're really, really excited. Gay Wardle is speaking and she's MC for the day. Rebecca Miller's speaking. I've got Kayla Zigic speaking. I'm speaking myself and I've got Leon from Aduro Australia speaking and also Dr. Donna Marcel. So we've got a great lineup. I've just looked at the menu actually and the food is just divine because everyone knows I just love food. But yeah, the 12th of November in Bundaberg and I'm happy to say that we've got $15,000 worth of lucky door prizes. Woohoo, that is amazing. And that gave such a good buzz when I was at the Sunshine Coast one, you know, like there was prizes, there was lots of engagement in the room. It wasn't just sort of sitting down in a lecture type form. You really brought the energy and the fun to the space as well alongside yummy food, yes, and a lot of opportunity to network with other people as well. So there's friendships formed, especially, yeah, when you, you're putting them in these towns and maybe they are 50 k's away from each other. Like when it comes to maybe going to Beauty Expo, for example, that might not seem so scary going down to Sydney if you're planning it together. Yeah, very much so. And that's what I wanted to create, an open space for therapists to not feel threatened and to be able to ask us any questions that they want. The long lunches, when we're in that group, nothing's off the table. They can ask us anything in a really safe environment. Yeah, absolutely. It's a safe space to ask questions. And, yeah, and, again, like the conversations around the table, like, there's so many golden nuggets that get taken away just from speaking with other industry professionals as well. So um, so where can our listeners go to go and purchase a ticket if they're close by? So they can jump on to kgbeautyandmodalitytraining.com.au and there'll be a link there for the long lunch or they can jump on um, KG Beauty and Modality Training Instagram page and there'll be a link in the bio. Amazing. And I say actually close by, let's just rewind and scrap that you don't actually have to be in Bundaberg to come to the long luncheon it's uh really an invitation Australia-wide if you want to come and see a different part of Australia we had um really surprised to see Carla from the Medi Spa down I think she's got a clinic down in Ballarat or Orange or I can't remember but I was like hey we've been friends and virtual community for so long and it was really nice to connect in person and yeah so she flew in for it and it was great. Yeah, it was excellent. We had a couple of clinics fly in from Mackay. 
So, yeah, it was great. It was really, really good. It was lovely to see so many girls at that event because we had nearly 100 in the room that day. So, yeah, yeah, it was very, very special. Amazing. All right, well, we'll share all the links and everything for ticket purchases on the show notes of the podcast and also for, yeah, just making sure they're a part of your world as well for future events too. So I would love to hear what hurdles you continually see popping up when it comes to running a beauty business. Probably staff shortages and lack of connection for regional businesses. Since that C word, we won't keep mentioning it, but I'll just say it this last time, We're not seeing BDMs going into clinics. We're not seeing education being ramped up like it was post the C word. Yeah, and I just think we need to be looking at finding ways to kind of get girls back into the industry, but also working smarter, not harder. If you're going to be skin focused or if you've got a beauty business, you don't have to do it all. Pick your niche of what you want to do and then let somebody, if you don't like doing manis or petties or you don't want to do lashes or brows, get somebody else in that specialises in that so you can concentrate on the skin side if that's what you want to focus on. I think from my generation, we did everything in under that umbrella. I don't do manis or petties now. I haven't done them for years because I wanted to be more skin focused and more advanced modalities. So... If you're a clinic owner, even if you're self-employed and you're on your own as a sole operator, have that in your mindset. If that doesn't light you up every day, get somebody in that can actually start their own business within your four walls and you're giving someone the opportunity to shine and get a little bit more confidence as well. Yeah, I absolutely love that. There is absolutely no need to be showing up for your business that you've designed for freedom and flexibility and doing what you love as a passion and not enjoying doing if it's feet or manis anymore because it's just not a great money maker. <laughs> it's not a great money maker, but we had it instilled into our head that when we did our diploma of beauty therapy, that's what it entailed. It's like when I gave Saturdays up. It took me 17 years to give Saturdays up. Because I was too worried if I was going to lose clients. Did I lose clients? Three. Yeah. Waited 17 years to do it. Yeah, it's true. Yes, you really can. You can design it how you want. And maybe Saturdays are the only day. Maybe Sundays are a work day for you because Monday and Tuesday works better for you to be off with your children. Whatever it looks like for you. You just need to make that decision and then, you know, market your business accordingly and your clients will come. So I think you hit the nail on the head there. Absolutely. So I would love to know when they're starting their business, what would be two important tips for the Aspired Beauty Boss listener to learn from? My wonderful father's wisdom, do a small business management course. That was the best advice my father ever gave me. Because it just gives you that foundation so you understand the business side of it. Look, we're all great with skin and that's what we're good at. But when it comes to the business side, we can actually be crap at it. That's not our forte. So dad didn't hand over the business to me until I completed that. I think it was a cert four in small business management. And that was the best advice I ever got. And the second one would be, Map out a business plan. Write it all down. Write down from start to finish what your business plan looks like so you don't get sidetracked. I know when I built the salon in Harvey Bay, I did a a business plan and I stuck to it because I like shiny objects. And when I was looking to decorate the clinic, I could have spent another 20 grand. But I didn't. I stuck to that business plan. I set myself a budget in that business plan and I stayed to that business plan because girls get a bit carried away with stuff when we see stuff in the shop. Yeah, so that's probably the two things that I would give girls going in and wanting to start up their own business. And you don't have to have everything yesterday. I just, I find that we're probably at the stage in 2023 that we want everything yesterday. 
or we want what our parents had, but we didn't realise it took our parents 20 years to get it. We tend yep. to kind of overcapitalise on what we want and that's when we can get ourselves into trouble. I'm not saying don't dream it. It's possible, but you don't have to have every bit of equipment in your clinic straight away. 100%. I am so with you there. It took me the first real four years in my clinic before I even really introduced skin properly because I was working for a skincare company and I was building my business up on the side on night times and weekends. And it wasn't until I had my son, Emilio, that I was like, okay, I'm going to really step into the skin space. It's more of a, a profit area and passion of what I really want to be doing every single day. And that's when I was like, okay, if I'm going to be doing that, then what one piece of machinery that I can put on my vision board? And I did, and I worked out how much it was going to be, and then I put money aside for it. I actually created a package that I sold in pre-launch to pay the machine off before I'd even ordered it. You know, it's those little things that's like, yeah, you really don't have to have everything. And how amazing is it that you can bring your clients along the journey with you as well? They absolutely love hearing how you are growing your business and how they have supported you and being loyal to actually help you achieve these goals as well. So, And yeah, we do definitely will have a bit of shiny object syndrome. So that's why that plan is so, so important to know. And that discovery of like, okay, what is it that I don't want to be doing? And what is it that I do want to be doing? And then design your plan around that. Yeah, exactly. And look, if I was to give a therapist that wants to open up their business, the first thing I would be saying to them is grab yourself an LED. If you're going to invest in anything in your clinic, grab an LED. Yes. 